so i'll be talking to you about this common topic that is records so it's a uh, there are two main types of records one is calcipenic where either calcium is deficient or vitamin d is deficient so that the calcium level in the body goes down because of vitamin d deficiency due to calcium deficiency or both together the other type is due to phosphoenic records where dietary phosphate intake is inadequate or excess renal tubular loss whatever the way phosphorus levels are serum phosphate levels are low in phosphoenic records and when it comes to serum parathyroid hormone levels the easiest way to differentiate the two types of records is doing parathyroid hormone which is elevated in calcipenic records and normal in phosphoenic records so when it comes to calcipenic records as i told you earlier the reasons could be either calcium deficiency in the diet nutritional vitamin d deficiency which is inadequate sun exposure or low vitamin d content in the food most of the time it is poor sun exposure because most of our food items are not vitamin d fortified so it's very difficult to obtain adequate amount of daily vitamin d uh, amount so only from the diet so if there is inadequate sun exposure they can get nutritional what you call nutritional vitamin d deficiency and this vitamin d deficiency could be secondary to malabsorption liver disease renal insufficiency very rarely 25 hydroxylase deficiency where the step in the liver 25 hydroxylase it's a genetic uh, condition 25 hydroxylase is not there so uh, liver conversion of vitamin d 25 hydroxylation of the vitamin d does not take place followed by deficiency in active vitamin d so that calcium absorption get impaired resulting in calcipenic records other two genetic types of vitamin d dependent records uh, uh, calcipenic records are vitamin d dependent records type 1 where 1 alpha hydroxylation part is defective so that the patient does not uh, make active vitamin d metabolites because of that calcium absorption is impaired and develop calcipenic records the other tier type is vitamin d dependent records type 2 even though the vitamin active vitamin d is formed there is endogen resistance so they have high 125 hydroxy vitamin d level but calcipenic because there is endogen resistance out of all these types of records nutritional records is the most common type which you have to identify and treat appropriately so as i told you earlier its records is a defective mineralization of growing bones when the mineralization is defective in a adult we call it osteomalacia so patients with records can have defective mineralization of the other parts of the brain uh, other part of the bone resulting in osteopenia and growing plate when there is def uh, defective mineralization you get features of records like cupping fraying and splaying as i shown in the picture and the peak age is between 3 to 18 months of age uh, due to vitamin d deficiency or calcium deficiency or together so both these conditions are considered as nutritional records when we talk about the vitamin d production pathway it can produce from the uh, ultraviolet light when it gets when the skin gets exposed to ultraviolet sunlight 7d hydroxy cholesterol gets converted to pre vitamin d3 and then due to the heat within the skin it gets converted to d2 d2 pre vitamin d2 gets converted to vitamin d2 and then gets into the circulation and binds to vitamin d binding protein or else we get from diet and all this vitamin d goes to the liver where 25 hydroxylation takes place so the animal 
production of vitamin D when, when we get ad, vitamin D from the skin or animal sources. The vitamin D type is D3, that is calcitriol. Uh, vitamin D2 is uh, plant products. Both have similar efficacy. Then that goes to uh, when the 25 hydroxylation takes place in the liver, that 25 hydroxy vitamin D enters the kidney and gets activated via 1 alpha hydroxylation. When this 1 alpha hydroxylation 125 hydroxy vitamin D increase the calcium absorption and the phosphate absorption from the intestine and improve the calcium and phosphorus levels in the blood. And when enough calcium is there, PTH will get inhibited. If there is no, uh, no inadequate vitamin D or calcium, PTH will become activated. PTH concentration is high. That is why in calcipenic records you get secondary hyperparathyroidism. So when we have enough 125 hydroxy vitamin D, it gets deactivated within the kidney to calcitroic acid and it's treated via urine. So the circulating vitamin D that we uh, measure is 25 hydroxy vitamin D2, 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. In combination, we have to that uh, the the combined form is measured, and uh, we get the report as vitamin D or 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is low in nutritional records. But if you happen to check 125 level in nutritional records, this 125 levels are high as a compensatory mechanism. So without, if you check 125 levels, considering the vitamin D dependent records rather than nutritional records, without getting the uh, vitamin D deficiency corrected, you will definitely see high 125 levels and you will be mislabeling a patient as having vitamin D dependent records. So because of that, we advise you to check 25 hydroxy vitamin D and see whether it is in the normal range. If it is not in the normal range, correct it and while it is in the normal range you may check the 125 level and if it is low you can consider vitamin d dependent records type 1 or if it is high if 125 levels are high you may uh, diagnose 125 uh, sorry vitamin d dependence records type 2. The presentation there are two peaks first peak is within the first few years of life where the growth spurt is rapid and the other area, uh, other ages at 10 to 11 years, between uh, 10 to 13 years of age, but they do not have records, they will present with uh, hypocalcemia, bone pain, or weakness. Infants present with bowing of legs and delayed walking with features of records in the x rays. So, this is how their clinical presentation is bowing of legs, metaphysical widening, and uh, Rickety Rosary. So clinical presentation depends on the severity of the vitamin D deficiency and duration of the deficiency and the rate of the child's growth. If the growth rate is rapid, they may present with calcium deficiency and features of seizures or carbopedal spasms because with the rapid growth rate, they need more calcium, but the body is unable to maintain the calcium level in that normal range. So the calcium level goes down and they develop seizures. And also the presentation depends on the dietary calcium content. So when, when you consider the biochemical investigations, 25 hydroxy vitamin D level is the main uh, biochemical component that we have to check to diagnose vitamin D deficiency records and the additionally they will uh, we will be seeing high parathyroid hormone level elevated alkaline phosphatase levels in the presence of normal serum calcium because when the parathyroid hormone level goes up the bone gets destroyed and the calcium levels are kept within the normal range by bone resorption because of that, most of the time, patients with vitamin D deficiency or nutritional records have normal serum calcium level unless they are in the rapid growth phase, that is the early infancy. And they can have low normal low, low normal low, low fasting phosphorus levels, not as low as in vitamin D dependent records. 
So it's a spectrum. It could either be only vitamin D deficiency or it could either be only calcium deficiency or a combination. So there are three types, mild vitamin D deficiency, moderate vitamin D deficiency, severe vitamin D deficiency, depending on the vitamin D concentration. So as you can see here, 50 nanomoles per liter, between 50 to 25 nanomoles per liter, we consider as mild vitamin D deficiency. This is in nanomoles per liter. If it is in nanograms per deciliter, you have to divide this figure by 2.5. So moderate deficiency is 12.5 to 25 nanomoles per liter. Severe deficiency is less than 12.5. So how do they get vitamin D deficiency? So reduced syntheco synthesis. So a born, uh, when a baby is born to a vitamin D deficient mother, breast milk is anyway having low vitamin D levels. But if the mother is vitamin D deficient, the amount of vitamin D excreted through the breast milk is low. Because of that, they can become vitamin D deficient. And prolonged breastfeeding, uh, which means if they continue to breastfeed more than uh, one and a half to two years without uh, additional vitamin D supplements, they can develop vitamin D deficiency due to the reasons I explained earlier. Dark skin color. So the patients with uh, dark skin will have to get exposed to longer period of sunlight. Otherwise, they won't produce the adequate amount of vitamin D. So patients with darker skin color, reduced skin exposure will get low, uh, will produce low amount of vitamin D. Or else low intake of food containing vitamin D, which results in vitamin D deficiency. And it could be a malabsorptive syndrome like celiac, cystic fibrosis, biliary obstruction. They are malabsorptive syndromes associated with vitamin D as well as calcium deficiency. Or it could be reduced synthesis or so increased degradation of vitamin D products. Reduced synthesis can take place when there is chronic liver disease, chronic renal disease. Or certain drugs will increase the degradation of 25-hydroxy vitamin D like rifampicin, isoniazid, and other anticonvulsants. So the patients who are on long-term anticonvulsants, we generally recommend giving at least daily maintenance of vitamin D. Otherwise, they will become vitamin D deficient. So what happened? Low calcium in vitamin D deficiency. When they have a low calcium diet, there will be as a compensatory mechanism, body is trying to keep the calcium level in the normal range and the, the recompensation is to get the PTH high. So the, this mild hyperparathyroidism increased the 125 hydroxy vitamin D concentration, reducing the vitamin D status. The cutaneous production of vitamin D, as I told you earlier, depends on the area of skin exposed and also the UV radiation with the wavelength between 250 to 350 nanometers. If the UV radiation, even though we get exposed to sunlight, if, the UV, if we do not get the adequate UV radiation, skin will not produce vitamin D. So uh, when do we get the appropriate vitamin D rate, uh, UV radiation that is between 10 o'clock in the morning to 3 p.m. in the evening. And as I mentioned here, time of the day, season, latitude, length of sunlight exposure, percentage of body surface area exposed to sunlight, skin pigmentation will decide the amount of vitamin D production. So the more pigmented patients, people will produce less vitamin D. If the percentage of body surface area exposed to sunlight is larger, they produce more vitamin D. If the latitude is high, so if the patient is from a, um, from a higher latitude area with higher latitude, the UV radiation is less. So they will produce less sunlight, uh, less vitamin D. And the season. During the winter season in other countries, they get vitamin D deficiency because of the poor uh, UV irradiation of the skin. So white infants need two hours of sunlight exposure per week if only the face is exposed or 30 minutes per week if the upper and lower extremities are exposed. This is in general. If the person is dark skin, they require five to 10 times that exposure. So you can imagine how long we have to get exposed to 
get adequate amount of vitamin D. If we are to get adequate vitamin D levels in the body only from cutaneous synthesis, so we need longer vitamin D, uh, longer sun exposure with a larger body surface area. If I discuss the vitamin D levels in the uh, vitamin D content in the breast milk, the content is 20 to 50 international units per liter, and also that depends on the mother's vitamin D status. So, uh, according to the literature, neonatal vitamin D concentrations are approximately two thirds of the maternal values, and vitamin D's half life is about three weeks. Because of that, they may develop symptomatic vitamin D deficiency end of the second month of life. Because of this, because of all these reasons, it is recommended that all breastfed babies should be supplemented with at least 400, inter 400 international units of vitamin D daily to prevent vitamin D deficiency. Because if the mother is vitamin D deficient, baby will not get adequate amount of vitamin D when they are exclusively breastfed. So the plasma vitamin 25 hydroxy vitamin D is the reliable marker of vitamin D status and it depends on the assay and when we measure it both D2 and D3 are measured and given as a uh, combination. The calcium deficiency it could be due to low dietary intake or Increase phytate content in the food, which impair calcium absorption. So when they eat high cereal, low calcium diet, again the patients will develop due to low calcium level, due to hyper, they develop hyperparathyroidism secondarily, which elevates 125 hydroxy vitamin D level, reducing the half life of vitamin D. So these are according to the different age groups. Uh, based on the Institute of Medicine December, Institute of Medicine uh, research studies, these are the daily requirements of vitamin D and calcium for the different age groups. Uh, when it comes, the next I will move on to the other type of records, which is even though rare, vitamin D dependent records type 1, where 1 alpha hydroxylase enzyme is deficient. These patients generally present in infancy and it is a very severe form. They have low calcium level, they have low phosphate level, alkaline phosphatase is very high, PTH level is very high. Because of that, they get renal tubular dysfunctions. So proximal renal tubular gets affected because of this severe secondary hyperparathyroidism. And they have they should have normal 25 hydroxy vitamin D if you are to diagnose vitamin D dependent records type 1. And they have low or undetectable 125 levels. This is autosomal recessive. Treatment is either 1 alpha calcidol or calcitriol. Uh, 1 alpha calcitriol. Uh, in these patients, sometimes we have to replace everything calcium phosphate bicarbonate because they are their proximal tubule is dysfunction and sometimes even magnesium we will have to replace and initially they need large doses of calcium some we may have to give iv calcium gluconate for a long period of time until the records is healed and afterwards we can titrate the dose down initially they need large doses of one alpha together with calcium supplements Type 2 present between 1 to 3 years of age, autosomal recessive and 50% of them have alopecia and there is a defect in the vitamin D receptor. This patient needs very high levels of calcitriol and they need, they need very high doses of 1-alpha and they are the ones who may require intravenous calcium infusions for several months even because this is a very severe form of records. Then I will move on to the other types of records, hypophosphatemic records and uh, hypophosphatemic. Before going into that, let me talk about the problems with vitamin D dependent records type 1. Of course, as you know, nutritional records, it's very easy to treat. Uh, and uh, after three months of vitamin D, adequate doses of vitamin D and calcium. There are biochemical uh, 
differences will uh, normalized, circuits will heal, but deformities will take two to three years of time to recover. However, when we get vitamin D dependent records, it's lifelong treatment. We have to give large doses of calcium and invariably they develop nephrocalcinosis secondary to our drug treatment, which is unavoidable. So in, the, in those patients, we will have to monitor calcium creatinine ratio, ultrasound scan of the kidneys to look at the nephrocalcinosis. If they develop that, we will have to treat with thiazide diuretics and uh, potassium citrate to reduce the nephrocalcinosis part. Hyperphosphatemic records, it could be primary or secondary. And it is inherited in an X-linked dominant manner, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or there's another type called hereditary hypophosphatemic records with hypercalciuria. So don't think all patients that you see with hypophosphatemic records are having X-linked dominant inheritance. And there are secondary types of hypophosphatemic records. One is oncogenic osteomalacia. When there are tumors, they can develop hypophosphatemia. Fibrous dysplasia associated with McEwen Albright or not associated with McEwen Albright. This fibrous dysplasia can produce hypophosphatemia. Fanconi syndrome, where the proximal tubule is dysfunction, they develop hypophosphatemic records and low dietary phosphate intake. All these are secondary causes of hypophosphatemic records. When there is X link hypophosphatemic records, they are FGF23, it is mediated to FGF23, where tubular reabsorption of phosphate is impaired. Because of that, they have impaired, and also because of the FGF23 mediation, they have impaired synthesis of 125 hydroxy vitamin D and they have defect in osteoblast function. And those patients have low plasma phosphate, low percentage of t uh, tubular absorption phos of phosphate, and Tmax for GFR. The most important investigation here that you have to uh, do is tubular maximum for GFR, where the phosphate reabsorption is calculated against the glomerular filtration rate. If that is low, we can diagnose hypophosphatemic records. They will have raised alkaline phosphatase level, but not as much as in uh, vitamin D dep deficiency or vitamin D dependent records. They have normal PTH, normal vitamin D levels. They have normal urine and calcium, ex urine calcium excretion with X-ray changes. So whenever you diagnose a patient with hypophosphatemic records, Remember to check the urine calcium excretion before you start treating them. If they have hypercalciuria, that is a different entity. You don't add 1-alpha hydroxy vitamin, 1-alpha uh, calcidol for phosphate supplements. If the urine calcium excretion is normal and they have hypophosphatemic records, the other three types, they will have to be replaced with phosphate as well as 1-alpha to prevent secondary hyperparathyroidism. And when you treat those patients, you have to monitor their calcium levels, phosphate and alkaline phosphatase, plasma creatinine, parathyroid hormone levels. Once you start treating these hypophosphatemic records patients, they tend to get secondary hyperparathyroidism. So if the PTH level goes up, we have to either increase the increase 125 uh, cal uh, alpha calcidol or reduce phosphate level. Always check the urine calcium to creatinine ratio. Do the renal ultrasound scan to find out whether there is evidence of nephrocalcinosis. And don't forget to measure their growth, monitor their growth. And if there are deformities unresolved, you will have to get the orthopedic opinion. And these patients, when you do the biochemistry during the follow-up, you have to check the phosphate level two hours after the last dose of phosphate and do not, do not, I'm stressing here, do not try to normalize phosphate. If you try to normalize phosphate, they will get a severe secondary hyperparathyroidism, which can lead to tertiary hyperparathyroidism, which will ultimately need parathyroidectomy. So be very careful when you titrate the phosphate dose. What we have to look at is alkaline phosphatase and the PTH level and calcium creatinine ratio to titrate drugs 
in hypophosphatemic rickets. They can have persistent short stature and uh, they will need orthopedic surgery. Uh, the best better control is maintained if the phosphate is supplemented more frequently. Otherwise, the moment we give phosphate orally, they excrete through the kidneys because the basic pathology is not addressed and there are newer drugs to address the FDF23 mediated hypophosphatemic records in other countries. But here we have only phosphate supplements. So we, we, are, we are not uh, tackling the primary defect. We are tackling the complication of the primary defect. Because of that, even though we supplement phosphate, they continue to excrete it through the kidney. Because of that, phosphate has to be supplied in uh, frequent doses at least five times a day. As a treatment complication, they can develop hyperparathyroidism, as I told you earlier, nephrocalcinosis and hypercalciuria. So hypophosphatemic rickets, you will have to treat with phosphate and 125 hydroxy vitamin D. And these things have to be monitored at least every six months. Every six months, you have to look for nephrocalcinosis and hypercalci hypercalciuria. Uh, hypophosphatemic records with hypercalciuria, you will treat only with phosphate supplements. You do not add 1-alpha. Because of that, before starting treatment, do urinary calcium creatinine ratio. If it is normal only, you are going to add 125 hydroxy vitamin D to your phosphate supplements. And there are newer phosphate preparations now. We usually uh, gave this uh, liquid prepared in the pharmacy. Now we have phosphate tablets. It has 16 millimoles per tablet. And depending on the weight of the child, we have to give 1 to 2 millimoles of phosphate per day. And when you prescribe phosphate tablets, ask them to prepare it fresh. Take the uh, adequate amount of uh, tablet, either half a tablet or one quart of a tablet and dissolve it in water and immediately drink it. That is how you give phosphate for patients. You have to give freshly prepared phosphate. Otherwise, you won't get the appropriate biochemical uh, recovery. Um, Uh, other, uh, on the other hand, uh, there are some patients, those who have very good control, where they are compliant, where the compliance is good, phosphate, uh, their biochemical parameters become normalized, and uh, they will not have hypercalciuria or nephrocalcinosis because of the proper drug compliance. It's very important that they are compliant with drugs. So once the haircut is healed and if they are compliant and the, if there is no nephrocalcinosis or calciuria, we may consider growth hormone therapy for very severely short patients. Some patients do respond really well if they are compliant with phosphate supplements. Then only we consider growth hormone in other countries they have tried and seen some benefit. But... Uh, the best, better drug for hypophosphatemic record is FGF uh, donosumab, which is uh, durosumab, which is only available in uh, Western countries, uh, which directly affects this FGF23 mediated hypophosphaturia. So that primary pathology is addressed because of that, they get less complications, less deformities, and better final outcome. I think uh, that's all when it comes to uh, the topic of rickets. And when it is uh, due to secondary hypophosphatemic rickets, again, cafe au spots have high FGF23 level. Again, it is FGF23 mediated rickets, but it's secondary to uh, cafe au spots in fibrous dysplasia or patients with McEwen Albright. Uh, the patients who are having vitamin D dependent records, as I told you earlier, uh, even however much we try to uh, avoid nephrocalcinosis and hypercalciuria as a treatment complication, they do develop it and they may get end stage renal failure. Because of that, it's very important that you 
monitor their renal functions, blood pressure and growth because it's uh, vitamin D dependent type 2 is very difficult to treat without uh, medical complications. I think uh, that's all.